Brian, how are you, mate? G'day, Devilly. How are you? Tamara, you still made it. All right. Glad everybody made it, or, you know, all you guys have at the least. There's 15 of us out there. How do you think the enclosure look, actually? I've started putting up these uh, hardwood planks in the back of the enclosure. They look cool. I've got another one up there. Starting to get somewhere. But uh, what we want to talk about tonight is basically how I got involved with wildlife, um, you know, how maybe somebody else could go about it if they were wanting to do the same thing, um, that sort of stuff. And long story short, I've been incredibly lucky. Um, you know, when I was a kid or when I worked in zoos and I heard kids who want to be wildlife care, uh, zoo keepers and stuff like this, the first thing their parents would tell them is, oh, well, you're going to have to study zoology. And my parents said this and they meant well. And maybe it's, you know, the generational thing where Every parent wants their kids to go to university. I don't know. Sorry, I've been talking on TikTok for the last 40 minutes, so I'm out of breath. But, um, yeah, so, you know, the first thing that you hear is you've got to study zoology. And um, I tried to study, um, not zoology, I did animal and veterinary bioscience. Um, but the reality is I'm not a very good student. Uh, I have, you know, ADHD. I don't sit down very well. Um... I don't absorb by just being told things. I need to, well, basically I used to watch a lot of videos, which is how YouTube came about. I thought, well, when I was learning, what would I do if I wanted to, um, yeah, what was the best way I learned? So, yeah, I, I wasn't a brilliant student, um, but I love science and I was sort of naturally good at it enough that, you know, I, I was blitzing science in high school just because I was good at it. Then I got to university and suddenly I was in a room with all the other people who were naturally good at it and uh, I struggled. So I was really lucky in that while I was still in high school, um, when I was a kid, I was always going to work on, on the family farm. It's what my parents had planned out for me. We'd gone to agricultural colleges and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't until I was halfway through high school, I went to a school fate and saw a wildlife demonstrator who does what I do now, um, taking animals, doing shows for kids. And uh, I always loved wildlife. I was obsessed with documentaries, but I never thought you could make a living out of this. So it was the first time I'd ever realized you can actually do shows for a job. Maybe I'll get something out while we have a chat, eh? Uh, so I never thought, you know, people could actually make a living with wildlife. And I use the term living loosely. <laughs> but, you know, I, I watched this guy's show. I spoke to him. I did some volunteer work with him. And about a year later, I had a job working for another demonstrator, doing what I do now as well. And uh, I was still in year 12, the day I got my license, I got this job, and my parents probably didn't realise, I was basically going to school, um, dropping my brothers and sisters off, getting out of my uniform and into my school uniform, and into my work uniform, picking up animals and going to visit other schools. So I was really lucky, I, I got into a, a good, like a, a job very early on. And that's when I tried to go to uni after year 12 and uh, six months in, I, just, I wasn't enjoying it. I was getting as much experience as I could. I was doing uh, rescue and transport for Wildlife Victoria. I was volunteering at a dingo breeding center on, on my weekends when I didn't have wildlife shows on. Um, but I wasn't enjoying sitting down studying uh, until I was offered a job at a zoo in Townsville. Uh, so I told people like that's basically where I did my apprenticeship. I had some basic people skills, I, I'd done shows already, but um, you know, this was my first full-time job. I, I left home uh, at 18, I drove all the way up to Townsville. How did I get off of that job? Uh, I, I used to crunch in it, if you crunch in it Google, there's a web page, Australasian zookeeping vacancies. And I would send out a resume to every zoo in Australia, every two or three weeks. <laughs> um, and I'd done a bunch of short courses. I, I'd gone to Box Hill Tafe during my year 11 and 12 and done, you know, short courses in zoology of Australian animals, in wildlife caring, um, basic vet nursing. I had a certificate too in captive animal management, um, which I did as my year 12 subject via correspondence. So I'd done as much as I could. Um, but yeah, th this zoo eventually responded to me. And private small parks are often quite a bit more willing to take on somebody like that than, you know, nobody gets their first zoo job at Melbourne Zoo. Doesn't happen. Um, you know, they go to a small park, they get some experience, they probably do a certificate three in captive animal management, 
and they might do five, ten years there, and then they get to a government zoo like Melbourne, Werribee, Hillsville, um, place like Taronga, stuff like that. So yeah, I was basically offered a job up in Townsville, um, and it was amazing. It's probably my favorite place. I'd still be in Townsville if I could be. Uh, and what I particularly loved about Townsville, uh, the job that I had up there, is we all had our behind the scenes jobs. And my first job in Townsville, my behind the scenes job was the mammal keeper. So I was in charge of wombats, uh, koalas, and because of my experience with, with the dingo sanctuary, dingoes, and that's what landed me in that role as the mammal keeper. Um, so I was training dingoes, I hand raised wombats, and I'd, I'd be in charge of weighing and breeding and recording everything from their koalas and setting out which koalas the other members can use for handling for show. So I liked the fact that we had a behind the scenes job, but what I really enjoyed was even though we had a behind the scenes job, all the zookeepers had to work with all the animals. So if you go to a lot of zoos today, you go to the koala show, and there's the koala keeper doing the koala show, and you go to a reptile show, and there's the reptile keeper doing the reptile show, and so on and so forth. Um, we didn't do this up there, and it was amazing. What they did was they had their shows set out into basically two runs a day. So in the morning, the first show, like 10 o'clock, would be a koala show, a wombat show, a reptile show, um, and a crocodile show. Um, and then there'd be a lunch. And then in the afternoon, they'd repeat it again. They'd do koalas, wombats, um, cassowaries, dingoes, and a crocodile feeding again. So we had two runs of shows a day. And um, by, by doing this, it meant that we got to work with a whole heap of animals. But from the public's point of view, what worked really well is often I found like when I was working as a reptile keeper at other shows, you'd only get so many questions and engagement from the public. But when you'd go through all the shows, you know, a half a day is basically a tour guide, people who might not ask you questions at the beginning they thought you were best mates by the last show. So you were getting a lot more engagement. And that's where I became particularly passionate about public speaking. Um, you know, I enjoy keeping animals. Obviously I keep a lot of animals. Um, but I started to sort of form the opinion that if we weren't gonna teach people and be good at it, we couldn't justify keeping the animals. So I'd trade my behind the scenes jobs to do more shows. Um, I learned from some very, very good showmen while I was up there. Um, and, and you know, sort of worked on my craft. So, yeah. Can we start the snakes and do I have a black mamba? Um, no, we, we can't keep black mambas here in Australia. I'll get out some venomous snakes in a, in a minute, I promise. But uh, So I went from, from that zoo up there. I had to come home for, for family reasons. I worked at Ballarat Wildlife Park as a reptile keeper. Huge collection of venomous snakes. Um, worked at Maru Koala Park. I was fauna spotter catching. Um, so I went up the mines catching wildlife, but basically, um, I just wanted to give, before we get out the venomous snakes, a little bit of advice for people wanting to do this. Because look, having a degree or something like this is an amazing leg up. But I don't want, if there's somebody out there who was me 15 years ago, to think, oh look, I, I'm not book smart, I, I can't be a zookeeper. There's always a way around it. You just gotta want it more than the other people and be willing to give up more than the other people. You know, it, it might mean living on a crappy wage, having to move across the country, um, shoveling poop. <laughs> but, you know, th there is a way to do it. If you've got a degree, fantastic. But a degree without hands-on experience is next to useless. Um, the hands-on experience will always be preferable. The, the, the only real benefit of the degree is often it's a way to get the experience. But yeah, before we get out snakes, I just wanted to touch a little bit on, you know, how we got started. Um, and give a little bit of hope to, you know, if there's a 15, 16 year old kid out there who really wants to be a zookeeper, they watch our videos and we meet a lot of them, um, but they're not maybe a, an academic, look, you can do it. There's no reason you can't. But anyway, we'll put Jake on back and uh, we'll have a look at some snakes, eh? A little bit of stuck shit on your tail, Jake. All right, so I'll tackle the questions that I've amassed while I was rambling. And, uh, oh, there's not too many of them. The formal academic pathways aren't made for people with ADHD. Spot on. I just, I wasn't, was not good at listening uh, to, you know, an hour of just talking and then keeping it. So yeah, Trent, we can't keep black mambas here in Australia. If you want to see mambas, the person to watch is, is a mate of mine, Dingo Dinkleman. I'm sure you'll watch him already. Um, he is the Mamba man. 
Had to have a good look at the thumbnail fix. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a few blasts from the past there. Nick hasn't changed much, you don't think, tomorrow? Just a different haircut. Well, if you think they're different haircuts, there's some haircuts where I've gone from... Um, when I was at Billabong Sanctuary, I, I had shoulder-length hair, and my boss entered me in the greatest shave. So I went from one extreme to another. Um, the same, same smile, same eyes. Should I feed your albino Darwin carpet python during winter? Uh, yeah, if it wants to eat. So in captivity, pics are didn't happen. I'll send you pics tomorrow. Um, in captivity, uh, if you're not breeding your snakes, we generally don't brumate them or hibernate them. Um, and if they're staying active and warm, you can feed them all year round. But some snakes will just realize, like whether it's the ambient temperature in the room, no matter how much you heat the enclosure up, some snakes will know that it's winter and they will cool themselves down and won't eat. So don't stress if he doesn't eat, but as long as his enclosure is kept at that sort of 28 to 32 degrees at the warm end, you can still offer him food. All right, so we might get Brutus out first, our red belly, eh? There you go, Brutus. So the first venomous snake we're gonna take out, venomous snakes is what everybody wants to see every night, is Brutus. Hello, Brutus. Which tiger have I got? I've got Rami tonight, Rami. Rami and Rami. Um, so yeah, this is Brutus. Brutus is our red belly black snake, is probably become the most famous snake on our channel. Um, the, the TikTok people love him. Um, whether it's because, you know, that there's a lot of videos of me free handling Brutus and, and people just see that, you know, he's, he's quite a nice animal. Um, I don't know. Or whether it's just that the red belly black is so instantly recognizable, you know. I took a, a king brown and an eastern brown out on our TikTok live like 10 minutes before this and people you know, couldn't tell from one from the other. Whereas a red belly black, um, you know, blind Freddy can tell you what a red belly black is. That being said, a lot of copperheads get misidentified as red belly blacks, but they're very, very cool snakes. What have I made my hook from? Looks like bamboo. This hook is made out of a golf club, a piece of metal, and uh, Sally's need it. So I make every hook the same way. Rami is making me some hooks. Um, but all my hooks are made the same way. Something is a handle, whether it's a golf club, I used to use bamboo, um, a broom handle with a hole drilled in the end, or whatever. Um, pretty easy stuff. Then basically insert metal hook like so, bend it to shape. Everybody's got their own exact shape that they like. I like a very flat edge and a relatively, I don't know, sharp hook, I suppose. And Izzy though, I don't know, I've heard about these hooks for a while, Rami. Um, he might have had better offers. <laughs> and then using the cellies needed, I had a little, what I call a backstop. The reason I had a backstop, um, if you're catching snakes in the wild, let's say Brutus here's a wild snake in his backyard, you don't need that. You just have this part here. It's to uh, support his body, bring his tail up to you. So I don't have to bend down, put myself in a dangerous situation. And to support his body, you'd then put him in a bin or a tub and it's the exact opposite. Put his tail down, nice and gentle. The reason I had a backstop, is unlike a regular snake catcher, I'm often holding animals up like this to display. And uh, Brutus here is a puppy dog, but the brown snakes and stuff, they've got a habit of working their way over the back of the hook, sliding back down towards your hand. And uh, I don't want to be bitten on the hand. So that little backstop just sort of keeps them sitting in that hook. It makes that hook a little bit deeper, makes the snake a little bit easier to manage. Um, so yeah, good boy, Brutus. So, yeah, I know we say the same sort of facts every time, and you guys, it's with the same lot of people, so you're probably sick of hearing it, but uh, Brutus here is red belly black. These guys are, are found from basically Eastern Australia, from way up Queensland. Unfortunately, up in Queensland, they've been hammered by cane toads, um, all the way down here into to Victoria and Western and South Australia. These guys are responsible for about 16% of snake bites, but I've never heard of anybody being killed by a red belly black. I was talking to a very, very well-known herpetologist the other day who said, look, it's certainly capable, and I agree. Um, but thanks to modern first aid, uh, it just doesn't happen. People don't get killed by red belly black snakes. Uh, that being said, it's not something you want. I've got friends who've been bit by red belly black snakes, and some of them have lost their sense of taste, their sense of smell, uh, sensation in their fingertips. You're desperate to reach out for that camera, aren't you? Um, yeah, so there's some funny side effects from black snakes. And while a lot of science has gone into how do we stop you dying from snake bite? 
There's not a lot of science gone into what happens to you for the rest of your life after you've been bitten by a snake. Um, and side effects from some of these species are really no joke. Um, so, yeah, not something you'd want to get bitten by, but the chances of dying are pretty close to zero. Alright, well, what have we missed? Why awake at 3.46 in the morning? G'day, mate. Tavian? Tavian? How are you, mate? Beautiful snake. I've only seen one or two red bellies in the world. Both in Hall's Gap. I'd love to see red bellies in Hall's Gap. I've been up, up that way looking for them a lot, and I've never been lucky enough to find them. Um, you know, if, if I was going to go look for red bellies myself, I'd be heading northeast, you know, out towards Bendigo. There's, there's some good spots out there through Gippsland, through New South Wales. Um, Western Victoria, where I live, we do get um, red bellies, but they're very isolated. You get a pocket of them here, a pocket of them there. Um, I'm here now, Master Chef is finished. <laughs> um, so, yeah, all sorts of things like that. Ricky Mac has a video of a couple of red bellied blacks in far north Queensland. Yeah, they're certainly up, up far north Queensland, red bellies. They've been hammered pretty hard, but they, they yeah, it's red belly habitat. What else have I missed? I've made an adder hook, but it just wasn't up to your standard. The other two are ready to go. Ooh. I want to see these standards, Rami. Rami's been making me snake hook for a while, and, and I joke about it, but I'm very appreciative because um, I do have a store-bought hook. It's the only hook I think I've ever bought, and it was actually for my daughter. She's three. You've got to start better late than never. Um, but every other hook I've ever made is handmade by me. And uh, Rami's going to make me some because this one is what I call the tie band hook. Um, but it's the only hook I have now. So Rami's been making me some other ones. There's a cultural center in, I know that the, the, not Bud Bim, Brambuck or something like that. I do know the cultural center. Yeah, Malacuda, Beechworth, perfect red belly habitat. Don't mind hearing things. If I didn't repeat them, new people wouldn't hear them. Spot on. You know, like I, I tell people, I'm sorry I say the same facts every time, but the facts are the facts. You know, that the Eastern Brown doesn't suddenly become not the second most venomous snake on earth. Um, you know, that sort of stuff. It, it just doesn't change. So I either say it or I don't. Did I get an exact measurement on that hook? No, I haven't. On this hook. I haven't, Rami. I'm sorry. I should. Remind me tonight. All right, Brutus is a dude. Brutus is the dude. Yeah, red belly blacks are coming back in some populations. There's actually been some science to suggest that the head size has shrunk in red belly blacks, particularly in North Queensland, and the body size has increased. And what this means is they're now only able to eat a smaller toad for their size than they used to be able to. Oh, get out, Zara. Um, so yeah, they used to only be able to eat well, they used to eat toads, they'd be enough to kill them, they'd die, and they wouldn't get a chance to learn their lesson. Now, with smaller heads, bigger bodies, they're eating a sublethal dose, they get sick, and they go, I'm not going to do that again. So uh, that's the theory, but we have noticed that, um, yeah, they've got thought of death from a snake bite while handling said snake. <laughs> All right, so we'll get out another snake as well. Uh, maybe we'll get out Rami. We'll get out Rami the tiger. Um, so the one we got out first, Brutus. Brutus is the sweetest snake that we handle. Um, Brutus is probably nicer to handle than most of my pythons. Um, that being said, he would bite me if I smelled like food um, because he does love his tucker. But uh, Rami is a pretty cruisy tiger snake, but he's a pain in the butt because he climbs the hook. He insists on coming back towards me all the time. So this is Rami. Uh, Rami is an eastern tiger snake or a mainland tiger snake. There used to be something like five or six different subspecies of tiger snakes, but recent genetic evidence suggests that they're all one species. We've only got tiger snakes. Um, so things like the Chapel Island tiger, who looks totally different to a mainland tiger, who looks different to a Tasmanian tiger. Uh, they're just local variations of one species. It's like people. If you go to South Korea, Kenya, in Northern Alaska, in Australia, we're all going to look different, but we're all the same species. 
Uh, we just got different shapes, sizes, colors, uh, habits, things like this based on the places we live. Different traits work better or worse in other climates. Rami, stop looking at me. Look at, look at the people that want to see you. Hang on. I don't know if you can see his face. Hey, yeah, Rami. You're famous. So, um, yeah, they're all one tiger snake. The tiger snake before, like up until the early 1900s, was a leading cause of snake bite death in Australia. After the First World War, the Eastern Brown Snake took that position. Um, so yeah, the Eastern Brown is now the most likely snake to bite somebody in Australia. But it was, for the first hundred years of European occupation in Australia, the mainland tiger. Uh, the reason being, and again I say it every time, but uh, when Europeans first settled in Australia, we settled in tiger snake habitat. So tiger snakes bit more people. After the First World War, uh, we gave soldier blocks, you know, blocks of land to returning soldiers that were in brown snake habitat. So a lot of people suddenly moved to brown snake habitat. And we also drained a heap of wetlands. There's places in New South Wales and, and a lot in Victoria that used to be tiger snake habitat. There used to be wetlands and swamps that are, have been drained, turned into paddocks. And those paddocks are perfect for brown snakes. So we kicked out the fourth most venomous snake on the world. Well, it's now the fifth. Um, and we let the second most venomous snake on earth move in. But there you go. So that being said, tiger snakes do still bite a few people every year. Um, we did a video, oh, sorry, I can't see him. We did a video not long ago, which was an interview with uh, a mate of mine, Ben Avery, who was bitten by a tiger snake. He spent something like two weeks in hospital. He was on kidney dialysis. Uh, he's been told that, you know, he's got a very strong chance of needing a kidney transplant in his lifetime because these guys have uh, some properties in their venom that break down bodily and, and blood tissues. And uh, what that does, those tissues, your kidney's job is to filter that out. And uh, they put so much pressure on his kidneys that they just couldn't cope and his kidneys shut down. So um, poor Ben, you know, he's doing much better today. But he's actually given up keeping venomous snakes. He was told if he had a repeat bite in the next 12 months, uh, they don't think they could do much for him. His kidneys would just pack it in. So, um, you know, still certainly a snake to be taken pretty seriously. We'll put him away and I'll get out something else that we can put on the ground and maybe have move around a little bit, eh? Gee, that's just awful here. It was a very serious bite. Um, I, I hope my other half doesn't listen to his interview because I've had two friends now in the last two years bitten by snakes who have both gone on the news and said they've given up keeping venomous snakes. Uh, and they both said it on, you know, with my family and all that, I just couldn't. I'm like, oh, it's only a matter of time before my beautiful missus starts saying, oh, should we really keep all these venomous snakes? Because I keep a lot of venomous snakes. Uh, we'll get back up. 40 watching and only 14 likes. We can do better. Thank you, mate. Yeah, if you are watching and you haven't yet already, uh, leave a thumbs up. The more likes we get, unfortunately, our live streams don't do very well. Um, so, yeah, we, we need as many thumbs up and likes as we can get um, to sort of make them do them. Any snake could meet a feeding accident. Spot on. Any snake will do a feeding accident. Do I prefer longer hooks or shorter hooks? Um, it depends on the snake. And, like... It's like asking a tradie what hammer he'd have. You know, if you could only take one hammer, what would you have? He'd say, well, what's the job? <laughs> um, you know, I like a long hook for, for Eastern Browns, for Taipans. I also like a longer hook for snake catching. Um, I don't want to have to bend down every time I, I catch a snake. I want to be able to bring it up to me. Um, for demonstrating, I often like a, a hook, you know, maybe 30 centimeters shorter than this. I'm almost always holding this hook up here because I'm needing to hold it up and engage with people and that hook works really well. Um, so yeah, I'd like to have several hooks in the room and use what is appropriate, but through natural mortality of some of my hooks, um, yeah, I've only got the one now. Maybe some have forgot Tavian, good of you to remind them. That's right, smash that like button, thank you very much. Davili, apparently, uh, apparently the tiger snake is starting to look close to the brown snake in some spots. Is this true? Uh, tiger snakes are incredibly diverse. We have a tiger here. I won't get her out tonight. We've got Rami, but, uh, who's not patternless, but she's close to patternless. And, uh, every brown snake I've been called out for in Hamilton, um, has turned out to be a tiger with no stripes. So you get tigers with no stripes, particularly in Western Victoria. You get them all over Australia, but particularly in Western Victoria. 
they're not evolving to look like browns and they're probably not changing. You know, they, they've always been that way. It's just we used to look at them and call them browns. And now I think the average person has, they might not be able to tell them apart, but they have enough education to know that it could not be a brown. So yeah, they're not becoming more like browns. They've just always had a small portion of tiger snakes that look like brown snakes and people are becoming more aware of it. That's my opinion. Would hate to give up my pets due to health issues such as that. Yeah, it'd be pretty terrible. But um, Ben's Ben's like me. He, he's got a family. He's got a wife. He's got kids. He's the sole provider for his family. Um, you know, if if he was, yeah, you know, he's got he could lose his house. If I could get any snake without worrying about money, what would I get? Hmm, it would probably be Owen Pallies. Like everybody wants Owen Pallies. Um, it'd be more than the snake though. I'd want to build an extra room <laughs> because already like I've got the scrubby. Scrubby's going to get big. Alan Pally's get almost as big. So yeah, I'd want a room just for my big pythons. Um, yeah, be hard not to want Alan Pally's. Pilbara olives would be pretty cool as well. 90 centimeters, is that a good length? That'd be a good length. This would be, this would be over a meter. Like I'm 170 centimeters, 168 centimeters. So this would have to be, I don't know, 1.2. Only ever seen one definite brown in Hamilton area. Yeah, I've, I've caught a couple of browns, but they're all, I, I found one dead on the road south of Hamilton. Um, I've caught one again south of Hamilton, but once you go south of Hamilton, if you go one direction, it's very clay soil. It's not very good for browns. But out the stones, uh, MacArthur Way, I called a, got called out to brown snake there. As soon as you go 15 minutes north, you get the sandy country, brown snakes start doing very well. So, um, yeah, there, there is certainly browns around. Where do water moccasins sit compared to Australia snakes? Some of them can kill you in hours without treatment. Uh, water moccasins, I don't... I don't have the exact like LD50 like toxicity rating for water moccasins, uh, but they don't compare in, in LD50 testing to Australian snakes. Um, how quickly it kills you is something that's really hard to say. Like people, I take out a venomous snake and, and everybody says, you know, how long would you have if you're bitten by it? Who knows? It's impossible. If I'm bitten and I put on first aid and you're bitten and you don't put on first aid, I'm going to live longer than you. If I'm a bigger person, you're a smaller person, I'm going to live longer than you. If you're healthier than me, you're going to live longer than me. Um, if that snake puts more venom in than mine, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, but also you can have individual, like, allergic reactions. As a general rule of thumb, with proper first aid, almost any snake around the world, you're going to have hours and hours. Um, so, yeah. That being said, the first aid... Can I bring another python out? I can bring another python out. Um... I don't have too many pythons up here at the moment. We'll bring out Samson. You haven't actually been out for a little while. I've got... I've got three more of these enclosures that I've got to move up here, deck out, and then the carpet pythons will all be up here. It's just the olive python um, and the spotted pythons that are down the other shed. Pilbara olives are amazing. All right, got a question. Why do death adders not live in the Grampians? Just a general distribution thing. So yeah, there's actually no death adders in Victoria. For a long time, people have talked about death adders way up near Mildura. Um, farmers saw black and blue that they had them. And uh, a research institute put a huge amount of money into looking for them. So much so that they brought a dog into Victoria that was sent trains to detect not just snakes, but specifically death adders. And they spent something like two years walking around the bush up the Wimmera and the Mallee looking for death adders. And uh, they didn't find any. What they did find is uh, a bunch of Divis snakes, which are commonly called mud adders. And once they started taking photos of these mud adders, taking them to farmers, they were all saying, yeah, that's the one. So, um, yeah, th there's no adders anywhere in Victoria. The Grampians may well be, be suitable habitat for them. But the issue, I suppose, becomes, you know, like, you can have, why are so many East Coast animals not found in the West Coast? There's, you know, plenty of habitat in Southwestern Australia that would be suitable for East Coast animals. 
but there's unsuitable habitat in the middle. It's what we call island geography theorem. It's the reason why West Australians can't keep animals from the East Coast. Because, you know, we can't keep exotic animals in Australia because we don't know if they'd survive here or not. And some people would argue that, well, is a carpet python in Victoria any less exotic than a boa constrictor in Queensland? And while it is still exotic to Victoria, we know for a fact they won't survive here because they've had a million years to get here and they don't live here. Whereas the boa could work, might not work, we don't know, so we don't play, take the risk. And that's what Western Australia does. So long story short, uh, that's why the adder um, you know, isn't found in the Grampus. It's not found in Victoria, so it's not going to be found way into the middle of Victoria. Eccleston Angel, how are you? I, Eccleston Angel is one of our Patreon supporters. Rami is as well. Sorry, Rami. Um, one of our Patreon supporters. Everybody say hello to her. We always say hello to our Patreon supporters. But um, she's also had to have a, a couple of procedures and stuff done. She's not having a great time. So, um, yeah, everybody give a warm hello to Eccleston Angel. Got here late. Don't know if I answered this. Am I out of quarantine? No, we're still in lockdown until at least Friday. Um, I'm in regional Victoria, so we're now allowed out of our houses, but we still can't have other people come to our house. And unfortunately, that includes me going to birthday parties. So all last weekend and all this weekend's bookings have been cancelled. Um, so how long does it take for an albino Darwin carpet button to go white? Well, they're born albino, so they're... they're they're albino from the day they're born. Um, but they're sort of an ugly colour when they're born. And the older they get, the whiter they turn. Um, you know, by a couple of months old, uh, they're going to look pretty much like they will as adults. What kind of snakes are you going to find in Far West Vic? Caniva, Dimbula. Saw a pretty big snake when I was in Caniva when I was like five. So up Caniva Way, the most common snake by a long way is going to be the Eastern Brown. Nine out of 90 out of 100 snakes are going to be uh, Eastern Browns. Uh, I don't know if tiger snakes would get found that far north. Um, there might be some black snakes up there. Once you go around that area, like, you know, Little Desert, Big Desert, you get some other unusual snakes, like Mitchell's short-tailed snakes and bardics and stuff like that. But, um, you know, to go to find those, you've got to really go looking. If you're seeing a snake crossing the road, odds are um, it's going to be an eastern brown, so... Yeah, hope that helps. It's a nice area, Canova. Get some nice lizards and stuff up that way as well. I was sad when I looked up if you could get cobalt blue tarantula a long while. We said we can't. Yeah, no. So, yeah, <laughs> no exotic species in Australia. We do have some cool bird eaters, but they're, like, they're nothing like blue tarantulas. Um, but we have a growing amount of bird eating spiders, like Australian tarantulas here in Australia. Um, but, yeah. Right, we'll pop this one back and we might get out another venomous snake. Um, I don't know, have I got out Nala the King Brown or the Eastern Brown on this, or was that only on TikTok? Some of you guys have followed me from both, but... Oh, and I've got the Death Adder. Would you like to see the Death Adder? All right, we've got a Death Adder, an Eastern Brown, and a King Brown. What do you want to see? I was upset we don't have the green tree monitors. No, we don't, but um, that was just TikTok. Thank you, Tamara. I've got a memory like a sieve, remember? ADHD. Um, good morning, oh, g'day Carolyn, how are you? Just 4am in Southern California. It's amazing, you manage to tune in every week. King, King Cobra, oh, King Cobra, King Brown, Death Adder, all three, not at the same time. All right. Yes, Adder, 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 Adder. All right, we'll get out the Adder. I'll have to rearrange this because the Adder's little. Um, so, let's see the Death Adder. You guys, oh, you'll be able to do... I could just drop off the snakes and you guys could, could share the facts amongst yourselves. You know it all. Hi, Nick. How's your Scrubby's temperament? Thinking of getting one or a death out of her. They are generally... Uh, scrubbies are generally real gnarly. Uh, nippy, food motivated. Um, but I love them. They're amazing. Way to start your day. I know, aren't we lucky that we get to be the start to Carolyn's day pretty much every Tuesday morning over there? So, I fill you with the memory, yeah. My memory's just full of reptile facts. Short term, long term memory, very good. Short term memory, I don't remember what I had for dinner. That was like an hour before this. I had pasta in it. All right. So, the adder we've got out tonight, it's actually just by coincidence, the same adder that we had out last time. 
We've got a common and a northern death adder, and I'm using the common death adder just because he's a little bit bigger. And actually, oh no, you're not about to shit, it's just a little bit of wood chip. All right. So this guy here, girl, girl, sorry, it's definitely a girl, is uh, the common death adder. Used to be considered like the fifth most venomous snake on earth, but I don't know, it, it's in the top 10, put it that way. But it is by far the fastest striking snake in Australia. So she can strike uh, somewhere around half the speed it takes the average human being to blink. How old is she? Uh, from memory, she's four or five years old. I've only had her for six months. Um, and the like the feeding cards that, you know, the people that sent her to me had feeding records. <laughs> And they go back three years, but three years ago, there you know, it says that she was fed small mice, but it doesn't say her date of birth. So I know that she was small three years ago, so I'm guessing she's four years old. But uh, yeah. Other cool thing with our adder, I don't know if you can see it very well, if I can be very careful. She's on her tail. She's got this little yellow mark on her tail, and it looks like a grub. I don't, there you go. You can see that there? It's flat, it's got different scales on it. Uh, what she uses that for is what we call caudal luring. So out in the bush, find a spot where I can sit her down. Out in the bush, you know, she'll actually curl herself up in a little ball. She'll put that tail near her head and she'll wriggle that tail. We call it caudal luring, it looks just like a little worm. She'll wriggle that until the lizard sees it, it comes past to grab her, and then bam, fastest striking snake in Australia. Uh, strongly neurotoxic as well. So, you know, it's not a bite that causes a huge amount of pain while they do have big fangs, um, but it just shuts down nervous systems. You can't, you know, you, that animal becomes paralyzed. Uh, all coming in for that little worm. But it's pretty interesting stuff. Got to be very careful tailing these guys. So unlike some of our other snakes, when you see me handle the brown snake and the red bellies and things like that. Um, I don't want to call it blase, but you see me scoop up the tail, bring it towards me. These guys being short, fast striking snakes, if you don't get it just right, they can strike back to their own tail very, very easily. Um, and you know, the, the other big fact about these guys, of course, comes what, what I think was Basil was joking about, the deaf adder. These guys, the fact that they sit there, they wait for food is where the, the, the deaf part come from. Um, they're originally called deaf adders just because Early settlers thought they can't hear you coming. It's not that you can't hear any better or worse than other snakes. It's just, you know, rather than standing up and hissing and up and puffing, she's convinced in her camouflage that you'll walk past her. So people stepped on them. They thought they were deaf. And the adder part is stupid. They're not even an adder. They're not related to adders. The adders are vipers. These guys are elapids. They're in tiger snakes, taipans, um, things like that. But physically, these guys have that very adder-like shape. They look like puff adders and the adders over in Europe. They, they've got a very viper-like head. Um, so, my phone looks a little bit blurry with that light, but um, very viper-like head. And because of that, death adder it became. But uh, they're very cool snakes. If uh, a lot of venomous snake people just become obsessed with death adders, there's almost a, a subculture of people who just keep death adders. What have we? Learned some questions, eh? Just made an adder hook while listening to this. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Mike. If you're gonna leave a super chat, guys, either ask a question or, or, or tell me a snake you wanna see and we'll see if we can get it out. Um, so yeah, the least we could do. Hi, Nick, if you get down to Adelaide Southern Koala Rescue, you give Harry a hug. I will. Uh, Southern Koala Rescue have said that we're more than welcome to come down. Unfortunately, at the moment, we're not allowed to leave the state. South Australia won't let us visit, um, so I can't go to them to film. Um, Queensland won't let us visit, so I can't make it to Brisbane to film up there where I wanted. Um, SKR. SKR is Southern Koala Rescue. They're a koala hospital in Adelaide that I deal with a little bit. Um, we've, we filmed a, about a dozen koala videos two years ago during the bushfires. Um, and Eccleston Angel is a koala fanatic. She loves her koalas. She sponsored a couple of koalas around the place. Um, and, and, you know, we're doing our best to try and get some koala videos put together. 
Do I have any green tree snakes? No, I, I don't. I'd love them, but they're very, very expensive. They, they, years ago, they were very cheap snakes, but today, um, yeah, they're, today they're, they've just become trendy and hard to get. Short-term memory loss from smoking hooch. No, I've never smoked anything in my life. Um, I just, yeah, don't have good short-term memory. Yeah, look them up, Carolyn, they're beautiful. What's... All right, what else have I missed? But yeah, Mike, if you're gonna leave a super chat, ask me a question or leave me a comment or, or um, you know, ask to see an animal. The least I can do for those people is get something out. How old can snakes live? Sure, they're all different, but a rough estimate. Oh, uh, you know, I used to always tell people 20 to 30 years. Um, any mammals other than my good self still up? Oh, not, not, not anything I can show you on a live stream. Um, like most of the mammals that I keep, they're up now. Um, it's Boo the Wombat, you know, she's nocturnal. Our possums, our squirrel gliders. Um, they're all awake now. But as soon as I take the phone out of this room, I don't have internet reception. What I should do one live stream, Sydney, is um, I should do a live stream with mammals. Oh, the, the possums do not like being around at night time. But um, I should bring Boo up one time and have Boo walk around for a, um, for a live stream. She doesn't mind walking around the reptile room. The only problem is if I have her out, I cannot get any venomous snakes out because you can imagine if she gets into something, I need to get her out uh, of that. I don't want to have to handle venomous snakes. But yeah, maybe one live stream, maybe next week, I don't know. We'll, we'll skip the venomous snakes and we'll take Boo the Wombat and we can bring out the birds as well. Maybe a squirrel glider, a sugar glider. I've got one sugar glider that I might be able to fetch next week. But yeah, I'll do my best to bring out some mammals. Uh, we do use a lot of our mammals in, in regular videos. It's just night time. They're hard to handle. It, it's their time. Sorry, Samara. So, yeah, what I was saying. Um, yeah, I used to say 20 to 30 years for most snakes. Um, but the better we get at keeping snakes, the longer that seems to be getting pushed out to. You know, like 20 years ago, snakes were not being kept as well as they are. Some snakes aren't being kept today, but, you know, you reptile vets were almost unheard of, um, things like that. So we're getting better. Have I got any copperheads? I do have one lowlands copperhead. Um, I don't have her up with me tonight, um, but I can get her out next time. Yeah, the internet forgot about it. Sorry, Sydney. Um, I'm, I am working on, on getting, we've got to get, I don't know, Wi-Fi or something. I'm not much in technology. We are working on getting internet that works better around the property because uh, a project we're working on at the moment is because we're losing all our work from shows. Um, you know, like this weekend was, I don't know, six, seven hundred dollars worth of bookings cancelled. Um, what we're looking at doing is doing online shows where you can book us to do a private online like Zoom call um, where we can do the show that we do normally for your kids. Um, we can run, answer all their questions about wildlife and get out a bunch of animals um, and, you know, like go in, you know, a bunch of enclosures and stuff via Zoom for private talks. Um, but before we can do it, we've got to tackle the internet issue because currently I use the internet on my phone. Um, but yeah, if I can get the internet sorted around the property, we will definitely do some like walking around. Maybe we can go into the aviaries at nighttime while they're all awake and stuff like that. Charlie, what birds have I got? Uh, we only have two birds at the moment. We've got... Uh, a major Mitchell's cockatoo called Frank and a red-tailed black cockatoo of the Samueli subspecies or Samueli subspecies. Uh, his name is Rocco. I've also, I, I do have a pair of bushstone curlews that they're just living in another zoo until we get the permits and stuff sorted out from them. Uh, and my partner breeds poultry <laughs> for a living. So we've got like a hundred ducks and chickens. Have I ever heard wombats called land koalas? I've never heard them called land koalas, but they're basically land koalas. Uh, or technically speaking, it'd be the other way around. Koalas would be like tree wombats. You see, the the family that koalas fit into is called vombatidae or vombatids. And it literally is Latin for wombat looking animals. So um, if you look at the family, they evolved on the ground, which is why the koalas have backwards facing pouches the, the rump on their bum, um, that sort of stuff. Uh, and they went up trees rather than wombats coming down from the trees. So 
I know you love your koalas, Eccleston, but they're, uh, they're tree wombats. <laughs> and in many ways, the wombat is the poor cousin of the poor koala. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically in the grampians, mate. What do I think of the Mary River turtles? They look cute, but they're endangered. They are cute. I'd love to get my hands on them. They're the ones that people call pet shop turtles. They were in a lot of trouble. And then we discovered that they're actually in the pet trade and people just didn't know what they were. Because, um, you know, years beforehand, they'd been poached in huge numbers. Um, so, yeah. Another conversational topic, but venomoid snakes. Snakes that have gotten their venom glands. Can it lead to further problems? Don't like the idea of removing them. Um, yeah. I and every snake person in Australia, bar one, <laughs> is strongly against venomoid snakes. For those of you who don't know, um, any chance to hit me up on Facebook? Yeah, just find us. We're Wicked Wildlife on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, venomoid snakes, for those of you who don't know, are when you remove the, the venom glands from, from venomous snakes um, to make them safe to handle. Uh, yeah, everybody's against it. It's illegal. Um, and the wording of our permits mean that they now have to be handled as if they were venomous. You can't let the public interact with them, stuff like that. Um, as far as whether it could do damage, I don't want to say it's a good thing. I don't want to be pro or anything like that, but there is venomoid snakes who have lived very long, very healthy lives, but it, they could have just lived just as long and healthy without it. So it doesn't offer any benefit. It's like saying, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to mention names or, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I can't lie about the fact that there's been healthy, happy snakes that are venomoid, but really we do it for our own reasons. Um, oh, thank you very much. Don't know of anything to ask. Just help them. big thumbs up. Oh, thank you very much, mate. Yeah, always the one out there, reputation. Well deserved. Spot on. So yeah, venomoid is something, you know, everybody's against, um, but it is what it is. All right, we'll just talk for enough. Maybe we'll get out another venomous snake. Uh, Tamara reminded me, I haven't got her out on this, I got her out on TikTok. What, do you want to see Nala? Oh, thank you very much, Jane. It means a lot. Uh, I really appreciate, guys, you know, the, the best ways to support us, you know, I appreciate the, tick, the, uh, the the super chats. It all goes towards helping out here, looking after all these animals. If you do leave a super chat, ask me a question or ask to see something, I'll do my best. Um, and, you know, if people do want to, it's our Patreon supporters that help out. We are looking at doing a few more things for our Patreon supporters. We've brought out this merchandise and tea string. Wicked Wildlife jumpers and mugs and shirts and stuff. And I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to give like a discount to Patreon supporters. But the other thing we're going to do for Patreon supporters, just before I get out to King Brown, is when we go ahead and we do these private live streams for people, you know, where you can, a classroom could book us in for a, a Zoom show or something like this. Uh, we're going to offer a discount for our Patreon supporters there as well. So if you know they wanted to have a private one-on-one -on -one Zoom chat where we can go around the reptile room and chat with stuff, and uh, yeah, Patreon supporters will get a discount on that as well. Because um, basically, we're going to have to start building if we're going to survive, building the business into a COVID-proof business. Shows are amazing. I I miss shows. I, I hope that they go back to normal, um, but. but we're going to have to be prepared for the fact it could be a long time before they do. What's the most endangered animal I have? I don't know. While I think about that, we'll get Nala out. So Nala is a mulga or a king brown. I use the word king brown and it's a bad habit. I use it mostly because I deal with farmers and uh, they need to know what I'm talking about. So I say mulga and they're like, oh, what now? Hello, girl. Here we go. Get your sorted and comfy. So this is Nala. Nala is a king brown snake, or, or mulga snake. She's from Kununurra, the top end of Western Australia. Um, and these guys grow to be probably the biggest venomous snakes in Australia. So uh, top end king browns from Kununurra, Darwin, places like that. They've been recorded at three meters long. Um, and they're totally unrelated to the eastern brown. I know it. You guys are probably sick of hearing these facts, but um, when I do a show, you know, I'll take out an Eastern Brown, and people actually ask me, you know, how big does it have to be before it becomes a King Brown, as if they're the same thing, it's a size difference. 
if you're bitten by this girl, uh, brown snake venom is not brown snake anti venom is not going to save you. you. You need black snake anti venom. In fact, black snake anti venom is made by milking king browns. So go figure that out. Mulgars have such a pretty face. I know I like mulgar faces. They're just they're, they're, I like big chunky snakes. Like my brown snakes, Rowdy and Rover. I like them, but I wouldn't keep them if I was just keeping for my own interest. I'd be keeping probably I'd keep. Tiger snakes, black snakes would be the, the main venom snakes I'd keep. Um, but mulgas, maybe. I just like like local species. So if I lived up north, I'd definitely keep mulgas in the outdoor enclosure, which is where she was kept. Um, females in this species don't get as big as males. Most of our lapids, males are the big ones. Uh, generally, that sort of sexual dimorphism is what's seen in any species where the males fight amongst each other. You know, if the males fight, you're going to get more... Males grow bigger because the males are bigger, are going to win more fights, they're going to have more babies, and their sons are going to be bigger in return. So male mulgars are bigger than female mulgars, but yeah, she could still grow quite a bit bigger than this, uh, and hopefully she does, because you know it'd be fantastic to have a big two meter mulgar to take out in snake displays, show people what the king brown really looks like. Um, but totally different attitude and disposition. You know, she she arrived here a couple of weeks ago, and she was pretty wild. And she's already relaxing and, and, and calming down. Whereas our two brown snakes have both been worked out here for months and months and uh, they're still slightly crazy. So, oh, I'm, I might get out a uh, rover, our eastern brown snake after this and you can compare the difference. But, you know, this girl here, she's, she's not quite calm yet. She still wants, you know, if I put her down, she wants to disappear. But I don't blame her. Who'd want to be stuck with me all day? Um, but she's, yeah, she's going to be a very good snake. Perfect educational ambassador before long. I have been doing a little bit of work with her. So she's one snake where every second day I've been taking her out, letting her cruise around while I clean enclosures, um, just to try and work on her and go tame a bit. Oh, thank you very much, Sydney. Missing your bread lie. Nice to see if I've got one. I do have a bread lie. He, he's actually, he's not in here. Yeah, he's down in the other shed. But he's going to either move into this tank here, or he's going to swap with Jake. So by next week, I should have the bread lie up here and I can show you him. Um, and the olive is still down there as well, I'm afraid. But I promise, remind me that you sent a super chat and next week I will get out the, uh, the bread lie and the olive. I should get collets. I had a pair of collets and I love them. I had Jasmine and Jafar, our two collets, black snakes. Um, but when COVID first hit, we, we sold two thirds of our animals um, just to look after everything um, and the collets are just so in demand that they were just an easy snack, you know. I could sell the pair of collets um, and I got the same as if I had to sell like five or six of my other snakes. So unfortunately we had to sell the collets. Your mate has a collet, it's pretty ugly though. I love collets blacks. So we've got a video on collets blacks if you look them up, if you search us up. We're in a horrible drought in Southern California, we need rain. We've had our first reasonable rain for a while today. So we're, we're now in winter, obviously. Um, but it's getting pretty wet up here. First decent weather we've had in months. It's been so bloody cold. Yeah, my idea of cold's probably not the same as your idea of cold, Eccleston Angel. I, I complain if, you know, if there's a little frost, I'm like, oh, I need to move to Darwin. When you guys get legitimate <laughs> snow up there? COVID messed us all up. I had to close my dog walking business. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to hear, mate. Like, it, it, it was hard. Everybody's, um, everybody's the same. Yeah, it, it's been hard on everybody. So we, we will get collets. There's not many venomous snakes left that I'm really looking to get. I want to get inland taipans again because we had, we used to use slug. Our inland taipan was in a lot of our videos. So we will get inland taipans again. And... Uh, and I'd like to get, I don't think I'd bother getting another pair, but I'd get a collets um, if the chance came up. I think about moving to Darwin every time it gets cold. Four feet of snow. I've seen snow about a dozen times in my life. G'day Ada, how are you? Thank you very much, Stuart. Have I ever considered doing a bit where viewers send pick? What do you mean by send pick? Like where they, like the, the two screens are side by side or like if I do this, we're going to start doing Zoom shows where people can book us for a Zoom show and they'll be able to, I'll be able to see you and you'll be able to see me. Um, 
So we're going to do that, but it's going to be a private thing. Like I don't know how to do it when I'm talking to what, 25 of you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm working on something like that, but we're going to do it, you know, where people can book. Ireland's hard to get a hold of. Not really. Like they're, they're pretty commonly bred. Um, the thing is I'd really like to get an adult if I could, because I want a show I can use for a snake I can use for shows like now. Uh, I'd love to get a broadheaded, but unfortunately I, can just, I can't justify the cost. You know, it's, it's just too hard at the moment. Nick, you could do Instagram lives and accept people to join. I could. I don't have much of a following on Instagram. I've got a thousand Instagram followers, but um, maybe I should. I don't know. At this point, I'm open to any ideas we can to grow this channel <laughs> um, because the channel is... Get out of the nightcap. How are you, mates? Um, and, and set up a Zoom for me. Thank you very much. Ever thought of getting a green tree python? I'd love to get a green tree python. Um, they're certainly on my list. I've looked after lots in zoos and things like this. Um, they're one of my favorite snakes. I've just, yeah, same thing. Just haven't been able to justify the cost. And if I got one, I specifically want an Australian one, um, not one of the New Guinea ones. Oh, thank you very much, Kyle. All right, so before I wrap things up, we'll get out our last venomous snake for the night. We'll get out Rover, our eastern brown snake. Um, you know, we've got out the king brown, we've got out a red belly, we've got out a death adder, we've got out a tiger snake. And uh, you guys have all seen Rowdy, our big eastern brown. Rover is a little bit smaller than Rowdy. He's still a pretty reasonable brown snake. But, um, hang on, oh. Move this back so you can see him in all his irritated glory. Hey, Bubba. Hang on. I won't be able to read your comments for a little while, guys. But uh, you can have a look at this guy here. So this is Rowdy. Rowdy is one of the two Eastern Browns we've got. He's probably the prettier of the two. You gotta be nice now that you've played with a few times tonight. He's probably the prettier of the two. But the Eastern Brown is the most likely snake in Australia to bite you. Um, not because he's meaner than the others, but because Tamara can vouch for me. He's not normally this nice. <laughs> not necessarily because he's meaner than the others. It's just because he's found over a huge section of the country. Um, but if you add his cousins into the equation, the Western Brown, the Northern Brown, the Jewgite, um, they're responsible for almost every snake bite in Australia. So, yeah, brown snakes certainly have a reputation, and in some ways it's not very well deserved, but in other ways it certainly makes sense. You know, if you're bitten by a snake, it's going to be a brown snake. From time to time, there'll be a tiger snake bite death, very, very rarely a death adder or a type man. Hey, you're rowdy. Rowdy. Rover. Now you'll get grumpy, I've caught you the wrong thing. So yeah, this guy is one, one of the two Eastern Browns we have. Luckily, these guys are very, very short fangs and their venom actually changes. So one question we always get asked, especially on TikTok more than here, is, um, you know, are the baby snakes more, more dangerous than the adult snakes? And um, no, <laughs> most species, the venom toxicity, the, the actual chemical makeup of their venom, is the same from the day they're born to the day that they die. Um, in brown snakes though, there is a change, but it's in the opposite direction. When they're born, they've got venom that works very, very well on uh, reptiles, skinks, things like this. Still kill a person. Like you still don't want to get bitten just because it's a baby brown. Uh, um, but as they grow older, they include more mammals in their diet and their venom shifts to be even more effective at killing a mammal. Uh, and that by default includes a person. They're not you know, changing to bite people, they're changing to bite rats and mice, but what kills a rat kills a person, uh, which is why we use rats as, you know, lab animals. Um, so these guys do have what we call ontogenetic change. Ontogenetic changes is changes that happen mid-life, during their life, but are still done by DNA. So things like um, the green tree python turning from yellow to green, that's an ontogenetic change. You know, you can't see them as a baby, but the genetics are there, they're just hidden, and it, it kicks in at a certain point in life. But they're very cool snakes. Well, put them away. So the brown snake is one, you know, I do like brown snakes, but I probably wouldn't keep if I didn't have shows and, um, you know, people that educate, things like that. 
I just wouldn't be able to justify keeping them. Wow, it's already 9.30. The streams are so good, lost track of time. How's the diamond? The diamond's good. I've actually moved her. So Jake's there. The diamond's in another room at the moment just because uh, she's... Whether or not, like in the other reptile room, there wasn't as much sort of foot traffic. Like where I am now, my partner's salon, she's got a hairdressing salon, is in the room next to it. People have to walk through here to go to the toilet. I'm in here all the time doing shows with you guys. And she just rejected a couple of feeds in a row, which is unlike her. So she's gone into another room in sort of like a quiet corner. Um, and we'll see if she gets a couple of feeds in. And then we're going to bring the other enclosure back like that one, put it up there so she'll be up above my head height. And hopefully she goes back to normal. She's, yeah, just been a little bit funny since she moved into here. Had a couple of close calls with Brown's working on a farm. Just gone for a casual hurt. We did have a big one next door. Yeah, Brown's are um, certainly a snake that needs a fair bit of respect. Grew up with King Brown's. I like King Brown's mold. They're good snakes. Good snakes. All snakes are good snakes. But thanks for doing this. Greetings from Maine, USA. G'day from Australia. How are you? So I can get my hair cut and get to see all the cool animals doesn't get much better. I know. We're actually... I don't know, it's become a bit tricky. Like, they've got to walk through here to go to the toilet. But Liz has had to start explaining to people that you can't go and see the animals just because you want to see the animals. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's an insurance thing. Do I have a Discord server? How long have I been doing live streams? No, I don't have a Discord server. Oh, I don't use Discord at all. Um, we do have, like, a, a private Facebook group. Um, G'day, G- Eccleston Angel. Thank you very much. You have a hat just like yours, only yours is straw. So yeah, the hat's, my hat's not in this room. Um, yeah, the hat I normally wear is an Akubra Rough Rider. So Akubras are all rabbit pelt. Um, whereas American hats are often beaver pelts, I think. which And also significantly more ex- expensive. Um, ooh, I've accidentally gone all the way back up to beginning of your comments. Um, so yeah, I don't have a Discord server. We do have a private Facebook group which we have for our Patreon supporters. So our Patreon supporters, they they get to join our private Facebook group. Usually when I do a video, it goes up live there like the night before. So they get to hop on and do their first comment before everybody else. Um, and from time to time, they'll vote on what, what we should talk about or, or stuff like that. So uh, yeah, we do have that. Um, I don't know. If Discord's something you guys want, we can look into it. I just can't put more time into things that don't achieve or add to the channel. You know, like I... I work Monday to Friday on a farm. We, we try and get as many shows in as we can doing this. Um, and, and I do my live stream every Tuesday, a short video every Thursday, and a full video every Sunday. So, um, yeah. If Discord works and it's something you got, we'll look into it. Where do I get the enclosures from? I've built every enclosure in this room. So, you know, the crocodile tank. There you go. That's, that's, that's Minnow. Um, that one there's still empty, obviously. Uh, these ones, yeah, I build all my own enclosures. I'm not much of a builder. It's pretty easy to do. Videos on the farm work I do. Not really. People don't want to see farm work. See farm work, like, yeah, people love watching my videos on a, um, like, on, on Cooley Club, which is the, the breed of dog I keep is, is Australian Coolies. Um, people love the videos on that. But um, I try to keep it relevant to, you know, unfortunately, it, it sucks. But when I put up koala videos and wombat videos and possum videos on this channel they tank um and i'll continue doing them because they're what i love doing but if i go too long without putting a venomous snake video the channel starts to go backwards um so if i put up farm videos and stuff just because i like them it'd um be much the same i suppose people subscribe because they want to see me get bitten by a venomous snake or something um and i just try and teach you a little bit while you're waiting um so yeah Discord is nice, but if you're too busy, completely understandable. Yeah, I've never really used Discord, so I don't know. I will look into it. But basically, yeah, yeah like it's got to add to, like if Discord, and, and I don't want to sound like a business person. It's not business. It's It just is what it is. Maybe I'll take a visit while we have a chat, eh? Um, where are you? Hey, So yeah, I don't want to sound you know like it's all going to be business and dollars, um, but the reality is we we may used to make our living doing shows and now we can't, um, so we need to find a way to make the channel replace that 
if we're going to continue to keep the amount of animals that we keep. So uh, whether it's through merchandise, whether it's through doing our private Zoom talks where people can hire us to do, you know, their own sort of, um, you know, virtual incursions. Um, if Discord can somehow contribute to that, I will look into it. Um, whether it's, you know, something that we do for Patreon supporters or whatever. I don't know. I'll look into it. Though. What have I missed? Comments? Oh, thank you very much, Sammy. I have a can terrier now. Her name is Go Go. I have to look up what a can terrier is. How many times have I been bitten? I've never been bitten by a venomous snake. Uh, I've been bitten by lots of pythons, including like live on on streams. But um, I build quail cages. I I used to breed quail, Japanese quail. You want to see the farm work? If you want to see the farm work, guys, um, if you hop on Cooley Club. Of Australia, there is lots and lots of videos of my working dogs. I, I breed Australian coolies and I train my sheep dogs. Uh, Tamara's seen a few videos of my dogs. Um, it's odd the algorithm doesn't like them make farting wombat shirts. I know the, the algorithm's funny. Like the vast majority of my views is not from subscribers. You know, there's almost fourteen thousand subscribers, and the last I. 50 videos that we've done so far um, have got two to 500 views. Most of our subscribers don't see the videos. Um, and most of our views are apparently people who aren't subscribed. Um, so yeah, we've got to find out a way to, to really push this channel if we want to keep it going, unfortunately. Really, those are gorgeous Japanese quails. Yeah, I think they're gorgeous. I bred them as snake food, <laughs> um, but they were very cool. I would keep them as pets, even if I didn't keep snakes. Um, it's just, you know, they were more efficient than rats for me at the time. It doesn't add much. Just creates an alternative place for people to chat. But since I have TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, it isn't really needed. Yeah, I don't really use Instagram much at all. I use it more, like, to complement our Facebook. So if I'm going to put up a photo on Facebook, I'll put it on Instagram, and it shares automatically to Facebook. Um, this guy here is Prickle, our Cunningham skink, by the way. One of my favorite lizards. We won't stay too much longer. We'll wrap things up. I've taken out all the venomous snakes I was going to for the night. Remember Toto the Wizard of Oz? That's a can. There you go. I didn't know. They, Toto was a cool little dog. Am I okay for a call tomorrow? Certainly can. I, I don't know what time. It'll be like after work. Um, but I'll send you a text. I've, got, I've still got your number. What was that channel name? Which channel was that again? Sorry, I've gone straight out one. Not tomorrow, but I think some might, but I'm like you, I love all the content. That's why I'm here every week. You guys too, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd love to show more diversity of stuff, but um, at the moment, the one for the working dogs. Oh yes, well, sorry, what's that page? Uh, Cooley Club of Australia. Um, you know, I, Coolies is just the breed of dogs that I keep. Um, most of the Cooley Club people have pet dogs, but if you flick through them enough, you'll find um, lots of videos of my dogs mustering big paddocks and stuff like that. They're not the most exciting videos because often it's five minutes long and the first minute is the dog running off into the distance and then five minutes of nothing and then the dog coming back with 300 sheep. <laughs> but yeah, people, people like them. Yeah, the algorithm's a pain of a thing. What is it on YouTube? No, it's a Facebook page. Maybe I'll put up, oh, I don't know. I was gonna say maybe I'll do a YouTube channel for working dogs one day, but you know, I got a full-time job with this and a full-time job, you know, actual on a farm. A lot of people aren't used to seeing dogs actually work like that. It's so impressive. Yeah, people like it. Sheep mustering. Yeah, so, so, so I run sheep for, do I have monitor lizards? I do have one monitor lizard. Uh, her name's Lucy and she'll be in that rock. <laughs> Normally the lights are all turned off by now. I just keep them on longer on a Tuesday night so that there's some light in here to talk to you guys. All right, guys, we might start to wrap things up there. I think it's been, it's now 70 minutes in. Um, so everybody inside's probably tucked up and asleep. I'll check out the page I train dogs in my neck of the woods. Working dogs or? I, I, yeah, I enjoy working dogs. I, and I, I keep coolies just because they're different. And, and unfortunately, coolies really need a bit of 
improvement in the breed. Yeah, long stream. Pretty much all of our live streams go for an hour. And we do a half an hour live stream on TikTok before we come here. So um, yeah, it adds up. My other half keeps saying, oh, I'll see you on Wednesday morning. See you next week. No worries, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, if you do have any other ideas for live streams, you know, when this goes live, leave it as a comment or leave it as a comment on our other videos. And again, if you guys are, um, you know, looking for ways to help out the channel, the best things you can do, leave a th thumbs up. We've got 34 thumbs up. We've now got more thumbs up than viewers. But yeah, leave a thumbs up, a comment. Uh, the biggest thing is share our videos with your friends. We need to keep pushing this to grow. And you know, I, I don't want it to be about numbers. It shouldn't be. I love talk, talking to you guys, but um, yeah, we're back in lockdown. And it's looking like we're going to have to try and future-proof this business if we want it to keep going. Um, but, you know, on top of that, looking at the merchandise, we've got some cool jumpers. I've got mine arriving hopefully this week so I can show you what it is. Um, and, you know, Patreon supporters. It's our Patreon supporters. You see their name at the end of our, our Sunday videos. They, those guys are the reasons you get to watch this still. If it wasn't for our Patreon supporters, we would have had to just scrap the channel this year. I just couldn't keep the animals um, to the standard that I want to. I don't want to have to go and keep everything in plastic tubs just because times are, are short. So, um, yeah, they're the things you can do. Like, share the videos, thumbs up, comments, uh, talk to your friends, and, uh, yeah, all that sort of stuff. But thanks for listening to me ramble on, guys. And... Um, I will see you all next Tuesday, guys. Be nice to waddle.